When the last one was in, someone shouted, Finished! And the hatch was slammed shut. The C-47 began to take off at maximum throttle. It was a much slower beast than a Zero and seemed to take forever before we took off. Someone even shouted impatiently for the pilots to get a move on. We were relieved for a moment until we saw several red flashes from the window. It seemed that the Americans had already made it as far as the airbase and had spotted us. They were shooting at us, so the C-47 took evasive action as best it could. This, we thought, was surely the end. There were no seats. Twenty of us sat cross-legged on the floor holding onto ropes for support. There was still a danger that American fighters would come after us, so we kept our ease peeled looking out the windows into the darkness. The C-47 heeded to the east first, then turned north flying over Luzon Island. It was our understanding that the northern region of Luzon had not yet come under American control, but we were forever on high alert. Leaving Luzon behind, we then flew over Bashi Channel, which is when we finally felt rescued. As Japan had offered little effective resistance against the Americans heading south from the Lin Gayan Gulf, they were able to overrun Clark Field very rapidly. Fortunately for us, by the time we made it out of there, they hadn't yet secured all of it. If our evacuation was scheduled any later, the C-47 would not have made it. Even another minute would have seen us shot down. We got away by the skin of our teeth. Finally reaching safety, someone mentioned, they dared to come to pick us up in such dangerous circumstances. It must have cost a fortune. I don't know if this bodes well for us. Another responded by alluding to an old children's song. The way out is fine, but the way home is frightening. This light-hearted black humour afforded us a smidgen of inner peace, momentary though it was. We appreciated the rescue operation, but at the same time were acutely aware that some heavy burden was about to be dumped on our shoulders. Although our lives had been saved for the moment, I felt I had aged considerably in the short journey. The rescue operation must have been mandated at Combined Fleet's headquarter. Evacuating hitherto forsaken souls was certainly not what our Navy had been known for in the past. The operation was coordinated excellently, and it puzzled us how headquarter even knew we were hiding with the others in the mountains. Clearly they needed zero pilots, meaning the Navy was in even more serious trouble. Most of the experienced ones had already been killed. About twenty years after war, a Yokohan graduate met up with a veteran from the 205th Air Group at a reunion in Yokohama. It turns out that this fellow was the C-47 pilot who came and got us. Years later, I also met the same fellow at a memorial service at Yasukuni Shrine in Tokyo. Somebody called out to me, Hi Odachi, know who I am? I knew at once. Guess who hauled your asses out of the Philippines in that Douglas? Oh yes, that must have been you, I replied. The last thing on my mind when we were hightailing it out of there was who the pilot was. Looking back, it was no mean feat rescuing a bunch of airmen by moonlight in an unarmed C-47 in hostile territory. I felt truly indebted to him. Admiral Onishi of the 1st Naval Air Fleet and Admiral Fukudome of the 2nd Fleet and their cadre began the retreat from the Philippines to Taiwan on January 10, 1945. Naval personnel left in Taiwan were reorganized and ordered to defend Clark Field bases. It is estimated that around 15,400 Navy personnel remained. With a severe shortage of weapons, ammunition, food and medicine, Forcing the advancing Americans back was an unattainable task. The number who survived this doomed undertaking was a paltry 450 men. The others died honourably with unfaltering resolve against insurmountable odds. A troop led by Captain Nao Hiro Sada decided it was futile to engage the Americans and chose instead to hide out in Mount Pinatubo. After Japan's surrender, the men marched down the mountain in orderly fashion with a white flag. The Imperial Japanese Army forces were also decimated. By the end of the carnage, around 518,000 Japanese soldiers died in the Philippines. Of them, the remains of some 370,000 Japanese military men 
have been repatriated to Japan, but nearly 150,000 still rest in the Philippines. It is said that over one million people died there, many of whom were civilians. The United States lost around 15,000 men. These shocking numbers are a stark indication of how lucky me and my comrades were to be rescued, and similarly shows how desperate the Navy was to procure pilots for kamikaze attacks in a last-ditched effort to defend the Japanese mainland. The C-47 that evacuated us from the Philippines arrived at Kaohsiung Air Base in Taiwan just before dawn on February 3, 1945. Three years and two months before, the Imperial Japanese Navy fleet set sail from this very harbour to oust the Americans. Clark Field was one of the main targets in what was a highly successful campaign enabling Japan to gain control of the region. The situation had changed drastically since then, and Kaohsiung had been ravaged by American bombers. Falling out of the plane, we were guided to a mess tent and served a breakfast of white rice. We poured raw egg over the rice and devoured it without stopping to breathe. The mess crew looked bemused at how ravenous we were. We bathed for the first time in four months and even managed to take a razor to our hirsuta faces. A restful night was spent there before being transferred by truck to Tainan and then to Taichung Air Base by train. We arrived on the morning of February 5th and ran into pilots who had escaped from Clark to Tugekarao by foot, as well as survivors from Singapore and Borneo. Nobody ever expected to see the lads who disappeared into the mountains, so our arrival caused quite a commotion. It was like a big reunion, but the gathering was for a very sombre reason. We were all inducted as members of the 1st Naval Air Fleet's 205th Air Group. Lieutenant Colonel Asaichi Tamai was appointed as our commander, but I received my orders verbally from Vice Admiral Fukudome, Commander-in-Chief of the 2nd Naval Air Fleet. This marked the launch of Kamikaze Special Attack Corps, Taigitai, meaning Great Corps Task Force. Kamikaze units were formally assigned designations before departing on suicide sorties. This was the first and only time that an entire air group had been conferred a kamikaze moniker. From the outset of Tiger Tai's formation, three naval fleets provided an extra 48 zeros, making a total of 144. We were all placed on immediate standby for kamikaze assignments from Taichung, Shinchu and Tainan air bases. Procuring more zeros, although we supposedly had 144 zeros, the truth is that many weren't operational. Like most other pilots, I didn't have my own zero, so about ten of us were deployed to Japan in the middle of February to procure aircraft for kamikaze missions. Zeros came off the production lines of Mitsubishi Heavy Industry in Suzuka, Mie Prefecture, and in Nakajima Aircraft Company in Ota, Gunma Prefecture. We were divided into two groups. I was sent to Suzuka. We boarded a C-47 in Shinchu, and headed for Kasanohara in Kagoshima Prefecture, where I had undergone training as a Yokarin cadet. After landing, we immediately went to the command post tent. Our leader saluted the commandant, we are from the 205th Air Group. Our mission is to acquire new zeros. Such formal greetings were protocol when airmen visited other bases. There were a few high-ranking officers sitting on a bench. Cross-legged on the floor in four lines on either side of them were about 200 student draftees, all with the rank of ensign. I knew the squad leader. It was Flight Lieutenant Asai of Storm Course. Hey, Kazu! he called out in a loud voice. He came up to me with a broad smile on his face. It had been less than a year since I left this base for Taiwan, but he remained and had been promoted from sub-lieutenant to flight lieutenant. A graduate of the Naval Academy, he had always been kind to me, and irrespective of his superior rank, I felt that we were friends. Informing him of my experiences in the Philippines, it suddenly dawned on me how much had happened in such a short time. We headed to Suzuka by train the next day, staying at an old-fashioned inn in Tsu City, capital of Mie Prefecture. It was the first time in ages that I slept in a soft futon on top of tatami mats. A luxury car was sent to pick us up the next morning, courtesy of Mitsubishi Heavy Industry. It transferred us to the airdrome attached to the Mitsubishi factory. We test flew some brand new Zeros later in the afternoon and selected ones to fly back to Taiwan. 
We jumped in the latest Model 62 Zeros. I began flying in Model 32, so Zeros had undergone several modifications in a brief period. My first impression of the Model 62 was that it was clumsy on takeoff. It took longer to get airborne, and I needed to pull the centre stick fully back to lift off. The Model 32 only needed 30 metres before it started to drift, but the Model 62 didn't get any lighter even after 70 to 80 metres at full throttle. This was because the weight of the airframe had been increased. The Model 32 was armed with two 7.7mm calibre machine guns attached to the body and two 20mm calibre guns on the main wings. The Model 62 had one 13mm calibre machine gun on the body and two 13mm plus two 20mm calibre guns on the wings. The magazines were also bigger, so these additions in armament made it heavy. The engine stayed at 1,000 horsepower as it always had been, so even though the firepower was greater, the fighter's manoeuvrability decreased overall. I also noticed that clasps had been added to the undercarriage to attach bombs. Royal Escort to Shanghai, I think it was February 24th or 25, when we dropped by Kasanohara in our new zeros on our return trip to Taiwan. The party that went to the Nakajima Aircraft Company in Gunma also came to Kasanohara. Flight Lieutenant Asai was waiting for our arrival and tried to convince us to remain in Kasanohara as flight instructors for student draftees. Although students were highly educated and their military rank was higher than ours, the training period was absurdly short and they had next to no flying experience. We're in serious shit, I thought. We didn't respond to Flight Lieutenant Asai immediately and requested more time to consider his proposal. Sitting, as we often did, in a circle drinking in the barracks, we discussed what to do. We were all still teenagers, but we had seen some tough fighting in the Philippines and elsewhere. Young though we were, we reeked of the stench of war. Asai made this unexpected request because there was a critical shortage of instructors. Nearly all the seasoned veterans who would have been perfect for the job were dead. We were assigned to carry out kamikaze missions, so returning to Taiwan meant certain death sooner rather than later. There was a possibility of surviving this detestable war by accepting Asai's offer. We would be treated well as instructors and even assigned separate rooms. Besides, it was not as if we asked for such an attractive commission. The flight lieutenant chose us. Eventually, however, we had to acknowledge what we knew deep down. One by one we decided to decline Asai's proposition. I don't want to be thought of as a coward afraid to die, said one. They'll think we chickened out after having a few decent meals back home, said another. We unanimously came to a decision to return to our base. After all we had been through, we felt duty-bound to carry out our orders and die for the great cause. Let's return to be with the other guys. Let's die together. Brave words indeed, but honestly speaking, Asai's offer was enticing, and he made a point of asking us openly in front of his subordinates. Sipping our rice wine, we continued to mull the situation over. Someone said, Kazoo, at least you should stay. Another said, Yeah, it was only because Asai knows you that he made the offer. Asai had shown me considerable favour, but there was no way I could go along with that idea. What the hell? You think you're going back to Taiwan without me? Somebody else chimed in to help me out. We can't leave Kazu here on his own. As the frank and heated debate about me staying continued, the door quietly opened and an officer wearing an unfamiliar but regal uniform walked into our room. We all turned to scrutinise this mysterious visitor with his prominent silver epaulet. For some reason none of us saw the need to salute him. The officer politely inquired, You gentlemen are returning to Taiwan tomorrow, are you not? Yes, we replied. His next statement left us momentarily stunned. I am Chamberlain for His Royal Highness Prince Mikasa no Miya Takahito. The prince is scheduled to fly to Shanghai tomorrow, but I am concerned for his safety as there are no fighters to accompany him. I have been informed that you are journeying to Taiwan and I wondered if you wouldn't mind escorting His Royal Highness to Shanghai on your way. We were lost for words. Why would an officer of such noble standing, a chamberlain to the prince no less, visit our humble barracks at night and petition us so politely? 
At last, one of us dared to respond. We were just discussing the details of our return. Is going back to Taiwan via Shanghai possible? It sounded like the perfect excuse to decline a size invitation, but our orders were to return to Taiwan ASAP with our new zeros. We asked the officer to wait while we conferred with each other. He remained in the room as we talked earnestly among ourselves. Our leader reported to the officer that we had no objection but required him to get the go-ahead from our fleet superiors. He left our barracks happy to comply. He came back later to inform us that the matter was settled. You will escort His Royal Highness to Shanghai before returning to Taiwan via Fujian in China. We don't know exactly what transpired behind the scenes, but these were our new orders. It fell on my shoulders to tell Asai, We hope for your understanding as this is a request to escort His Royal Highness. Asai seemed to know already and gave me a wry smile. It was all rather uncomfortable. The weather the following morning was fine, and two sections making eight zeros in total got ready for this important task. We took off from Kasanuara and circled above as we waited for the Mitsubishi Navy Type 1 attack bomber, G4M, with its Imperial passenger on board to depart from neighbouring Kanoya Air Base. The G4M caught up with us, we flew in formation in two teams positioned on either side of the bomber as we proceeded to Shanghai. My zero was number three in the right team, meaning that I was positioned closest to our August company. We crossed over the Gulf of Kagoshima and flew out to the open sea, turning slightly to the right. Our initial objective was Jeju Island in the Tsushima Channel. When the island was visible in the distance, we headed west-southwest in the direction of Shanghai. I think we went via Jeju Island first because it was safer than flying directly to Shanghai. There were several windows on the right side of the G4M. I could see somebody sitting by the third or fourth window. The G4M swayed slightly, and I moved in a little closer about 30 or 40 metres away. The person whom I thought may be Prince Mikasa looked out of the window and smiled as he gave me a wave of his hand. He had a gentle countenance and I sensed that he was grateful for our escort. I reciprocated with a bow and firmed my resolve to get him to his destination safely. After we changed direction, I noticed the colour of the sea below was blue on one side and yellow on the other. I had never seen Yellow Ocean before. I thought China would come into view soon, but it took longer than I expected. It was only after our arrival that I realised we had flown above the mouth of Yangzhu Ziang River. It was so expansive that I had mistook it for the ocean but it explained why the water was such an odd hue. Stand by underwings. The G4M landed first while we circled above on lookout. I could see several people alighting the aircraft and ambling towards a building. We received the signal to make our own landing, but never saw our imperial patron in the flesh. As always, we trotted to the command post to make a formal greeting to the base commandant. He ordered us to stand by underwings. It was a basic rule to obey any base commandant, even if we were affiliated with different branches of the military. Standby under wings was a directive for airmen to stay close to their machines, even sleeping under the wings ready to scramble. We received intelligence that an American convoy had crossed the sea between Okinawa and Taiwan and was now in the East China Sea. To our utter disbelief, we also learned that there were no naval fighter planes left anywhere in China. That is why we were instructed to remain on standby instead of being allowed to continue to Taiwan. We watched over the Shanghai skies from early in the morning to night. Four zeros made up one section, and each took turns doing three-hour shifts of watch duty. We were exhausted. News reached us a few days later that the Americans had sailed out of the region, but we had to keep guard in case they returned. I recall staying in Shanghai for around ten days, we happily visited the Shanghai Navy Club several times while there. It was a beautiful town with its western-style buildings all in neat rows. It seemed out of place in China. We returned to Taiwan, flying along the southern coastline by way of Fujian province. The bomber that transported Prince Mikasa had already gone back to Japan. We never knew why the prince visited Shanghai or when he left. 
Orders to escort a dignitary of this status should have come directly from our superiors. It was unthinkable that a high-ranking officer such as the Chamberlain of His Royal Highness should bid us directly. The fact that he came to our lowly barracks in the first place was extraordinary. Even with the acute lack of operational aircraft, it did not make any sense that a prince was not assigned even a single fighter escort. The whole affair left us with a sense of foreboding, but we did not ruminate on it too long. At the forefront of our minds now was getting back to Taiwan. After the war, I heard that Prince Mikasa was engaged in activities opposed to the Tojo cabinet. Even so, why would he be travelling at such a perilous time in such a dangerous region? And, as Prince Mikasa was affiliated to the army, why were naval aviators asked to assist him? Again, why would the navy provide him with a G4M for transport, but no escorts? He was the emperor's brother after all, so this treatment seemed tremendously discourteous. I still wonder about the whole affair to this day. Awarded a short sword not long after returning to Taiwan from Shanghai on March 10, 1945, there was a ceremony held at Taichung for our special attack corps, Tai Gi Tai. The names of 103 airmen were written on the official roster, and we were all presented with a commemorative short sword sheathed in white wooden scabbard and inscribed with the words, Awarded to Kamikaze, by Soemu Toyoda. This was the name of the Commander-in-Chief of the Imperial Japanese Navy Combined Fleet. I considered the sword to be a kind of alter ego. Taigitai was made up of relatively experienced airmen, but its stated mission was the defence of Taiwan and Okinawa through suicide attacks, with the primary targets being aircraft carriers rather than convoy ships. Our main base was in Taichung, but units were spread out in Shinshe, Tainan, Shinchu, Yilan, Ishigakijima and Miyakojima, two islands belonging to Okinawa, located just east of Taiwan. We kept ourselves busy as we waited for intelligence on the American fleet and for our suicide mission orders by intercepting bombers raiding from mainland China. We even continued our dogfight training. Sometimes we were called on to courier documents around Taiwan. Our Taichung base barracks were located about 1.5 metres from the runway. A truck would pick us up after breakfast. There was always someone who held up departures by a minute or so. But once we were all crammed in, we were transported to the runway like packages of freight. The truck stopped in front of the command post where a flimsy tent was erected for airmen. Inside were filthy blankets for us nap on or chat until the time came to sortie. In mid-March, we got word that the American fleet was east of the Sea of Taiwan. The Taigitai transferred its main force to Yilan Air Base on the northeast coast of Taiwan, making Miyakojima and Ishigakijima the vanguard for kamikaze attacks. I was stationed in Yilan. The bombs attached to Zeros in early suicide attacks were 250 kilos. Over time, however, an impressive 2.5-metre-long 500-kilo ordinances became the norm. I remember tapping one ready to be mounted onto the clasps and murmuring to myself, we're going up together. Model 62. Zeros weighed just over two tons, meaning that the bombs we carried were a quarter of the weight. Maintenance crews used carts to move and attach explosives to the undercarriage. When the carts were slid out from under the bombs, the Zeros dropped down noticeably because of the sudden increase in weight. The suspension and tyres strained under the burden and made an ominous creaking sound. Never designed to carry such a heavy load, the extra stress on the suspension caused zeros to judder over the potholed runways, rattling us to the bone. We needed 100 to 120 metres of runway when taking off in good conditions against the wind without bombs. With a 250 kilo ordnance under our butts, we would need 500 metres at full throttle. The 500 Kirke bombs demanded running the entire length of the airstrip before taking off. I was always afraid I wouldn't get airborne. All I could do was pray for liftoff, and it took every bit of the Zero's power to get off the ground. Once in the air, the climb was painfully sluggish. The lever had to be pushed forward at full throttle just to reach cruising speed. It barely flew, and our range was significantly reduced. The first time I experienced such downgraded manoeuvrability, 
I doubted if I would make it as far as the enemy. Carrying 500 Kiom bombs was an impractical and heedless move. This was my second tour in Taiwan, although the war situation had worsened somewhat. Life there was much better than in the Philippines. We were even allowed to take leave on occasion. Although American raids continued, we still had time to go to town for a haircut. To us, it really felt like Taiwan was a part of Japan, and we walked around town dressed casually. I wore a tidy, open-necked, short-sleeved shirt and khaki pants when three of us visited a studio to take some commemorative photos. My two buddies both died in kamikaze missions not long after. When we were in Taichung before moving to Yilan, a local family offered to make their house our lodge. This was a term used for private residences that were free for us to use as a kind of holiday house to get away from the stresses of the base. The owner of this particular abode was a graduate of Waseda University's technology department. He was in Taiwan to manage a munitions factory. Most supervisors of Japan-related businesses and factories in Taiwan were Japanese nationals. His daughter was a little younger than us and worked at a local bank. Four of us accepted their kind offer. Every time we got a pass, we heeded to our lodge first. We would decide beforehand which bar or club to go to that night and then appraise the family of our schedule, forewarning them that we might return late. We rode a bus from base and got off at the stop in front of the Taiwan Bank on the main road. There were always plenty of girls waiting for us there. These were fleeting moments of happiness, as we never knew how long we had left. The Battle of Okinawa and Kamikaze attacks, after American troops wrested control of the Philippines back. The next push was for Okinawa. The invasion of Okinawa started on April 1, 1945. The American 77th Infantry Division landed first on the shores of the Karama Islands, close to the southwest coast of Okinawa's main islands. This was to prepare for a direct assault on mainland Japan, so the Allied forces bypassed Taiwan altogether. The sea around Okinawa was teeming with Allied ships. It is reported that the US deployed 16 regular carriers, 28 escort carriers, 23 battleships, 39 cruisers, 205 destroyers, and countless convoy ships. There was an unprecedented number of troops with around 450,000 soldiers from both the Navy and Army. Of them, about 180,000 were ground force personnel. Japan had only 120,000 fighting men, mainly from the Army. They made Okinawa into a fortress in a do-or-die attempt to repel the invaders and to stall the inevitable invasion of the mainland. Scores of kamikaze suicide attacks were executed from both the sky and sea. The hostilities in Okinawa raged for about three months. In the ground battles alone, approximately 200,000 people, including citizens, lost their lives. The number of Americans killed in action is said to number around 12,000. Formal Taigitai records from the Navy have been preserved in the Research Institute of the Self-Defense Force in Minato Ward, Tokyo. According to these source materials, 23 kamikaze suicide missions were made by the Taigitai on US ships from April 1st until surrender in August 1945. My record shows that I made four sorties as a Taigitai suicide pilot. In addition to these, I recollect three more that are not recorded. My first suicide mission, there were two jobs in kamikaze suicide missions, human bombs and fighter escorts. Suicide bombers were chaperoned to their target by Zeros, whose duty it was to protect it from interceptors, and to also confirm success or failure of the mission. The escorting Zero essentially served as a shield for the suicide bomber until he made his death dive, so the pilots needed to be highly skilled airmen. In general, escort pilots were older and more experienced than the kamikaze pilots they provided cover for. My first sortie was on April 4th, 1945, in what was the fourth suicide attack mission of the Tiger Tai. A scout plane discovered the location of four enemy aircraft carriers, and we were given a directive to go for broke. My section consisted of two escort zeros and two suicide bombers. My zero was loaded with a 500 kilo bomb. We took off from Ishigakijima Air Base at 7.35am, 
and flew toward the coordinates at 10 to 15 meters above the sea surface to avoid detection by enemy radar. If spotted at this height, there was no chance of escape from interceptors screaming down from above. Even with ample altitude, we would still be seriously disadvantaged, but at least we had a chance to dive rapidly to evade machine gun fire. This altitude meant, however, that evasive measures to the right or left would result in one of the wings dipping into the sea, and that would be catastrophic. Adding to the precariousness of low flying was the inability to discard the bomb in case of emergency. We would blow ourselves up or be engulfed by the wall of water from the explosion. It was left to our own discretion whether to discard the bomb and fight or avoid engagement and return to base, thereby saving the machine for a dead cert mission. Shedding the bomb required climbing to 200 metres. In short, our only hope was to spot interceptors before they spotted us. The Zero's altimeters were not very precise, so I kept a very wary eye on the sea surface. This didn't leave much leeway to survey the sky above, as a split second of inattention could mean crashing into the briny deep. Flying above the flat blue surface was okay when conditions were fine, but it was a different story in stormy weather when the sea was choppy. Nothing was more frightening than surging waves spattering under the wings. I still have visions of the dark ocean with its white wave crests tickling my undercarriage. The sea was not so rough on my first sortie, so I managed to keep a careful watch in front and above me. Before long I saw some little black specks appear 15 degrees to the right, just above the horizon. The other pilots also noticed, so we communicated to each other with hand signals. They looked to be cruising around 4,000 metres. I leaned forward into the windshield to keep tabs on the dots as I ascended. The specks became bigger, and convinced that they were enemy planes, I decided to engage them in a dogfight. I released the bomb, and my Zero suddenly lifted up as if it was delighted to be free of the 500 Kialum ball and chain. I saw the other bomb-carrying Zero in my section suddenly rise as it also shed its debilitating load. Two bombs exploded in quick succession on the sea surface. I knew that this would give us away. We climbed rapidly, levelling out every so often to confirm the enemy's position. Four Grumman F6Fs were coming right at us. They were flying around 6,000 metres, while we were still only at 2,000 metres. The least I could do was avoid being shot at from above, so advanced directly at the Hellcat prepared to take fire from the front instead. Doing as I was taught in training, I charged the Hellcat so that my propellers would bite into its guts. If the Hellcat disengaged from this game of chicken and showed me its underbelly, victory would be mine. Still, the Hellcat was much faster and flying straight at me. I needed more speed, so pointed my nose down in a dive to increase my velocity. The Hellcat still managed to manoeuvre into the optimal shooting position behind of me. Sensing I was about to be blasted to smithereens, I pushed down hard on one side of my foot pedal while simultaneously pulling the centre stick to opposite side as hard as I could. This caused my Zero to slide just as the Hellcat let rip with its machine guns. The spray of lead missed, but it was a chillingly narrow escape. The Hellcat came in for another crack. I have no memory of exactly what I did, but somehow succeeded in fending off the attacks. The aerial combat only lasted a few minutes, and I was left exhausted and separated from the other Zeros. Having been focused solely on surviving the engagement, I had completely lost my bearings. I needed to return to base but couldn't be sure if I was flying into enemy territory instead. I opened the flight map on my left thigh and placed the clipboard with my mission memo on the right. The higher you fly, the more likely memory loss sets in, so writing information such as direction down on the memo pad was crucial in finding your way back home. Obviously this was out of the question when the enemy was coming at you from all angles. I flew around for a while confirming there were no enemy planes, and then set about piecing together my whereabouts with the chart and memos. Flew 135 degrees around here, engaged here, perhaps two loops at this point, then headed in this direction. I calculated various points with my compass and made an educated guess, repeating 260 degrees over to myself so that I didn't forget. I spotted Miyakojima Island in front of me, 
I took off from Ishigakijima Island but decided to land there anyway. One of the escorts from my section had already arrived. I was informed later that the other suicide bomber had made an emergency landing on Ishigakijima, and his chaperone had made a safe return to base. Fortunately, all of us had survived the encounter. I returned to Miyakojima the same day and discovered that of the other eight kamikaze pilots who sorted that day, one successfully smashed into a convoy ship. Consecutive sorties with bombs, an American bomber was shot down over Ishigaki-jima. Among the belongings of a pilot who bailed out was a flight map showing the location of US troop ships. With this information in hand, we sorted early the next morning. At 7.20am, a suicide bomber and one Escort Zero took off. Three more suicide bombers, including me, and two wingmen sorted shortly after. Our orders were to head to Hateruma Island south of Ishigakijima first, fly 110 degrees to the right for 150 kilometres, then turn to the right again for another 18 kilometres to search and destroy enemy ships. With a 500 kilar bomb under me, I embarked on what was the fifth Taigitai sortie. Almost immediately, one of the Zeros had to return to base with engine trouble. Ten minutes later, team leader Lieutenant Takeuchi's engine cut out at 15 metres altitude. Flying to his left rear, I caught a glimpse of him desperately trying to restart the engine. His Zero disappeared into the ocean with hardly a splash. I met Lieutenant Takeuchi's sisters at a memorial ceremony in Yasukuni Shrine twenty years after war. I told them the details of his demise as official reports always omitted the specifics. They had long been desperate to learn of the fate of their brother, and I hoped that they could find some closure. Five zeros became three in the blink of an eye. The second escort zero, flown by Superior Flight Petty Officer Hori, took over Sub-Lieutenant Takuchi's role as section leader. The third escort, Zero, was piloted by my close friend, Flight Petty Officer, First Class Katsumi Kagawa. A few minutes into the flight, we spotted a submarine periscope protruding out of the ocean. There was no doubt it was American, and Hori signalled to me with hand signs, yes or no. Although Zeros had radios to communicate with, they were almost useless. He was asking whether we should take out the submarine. I signalled him back, no as did the other suicide bomber. Our target had to be a carrier, not a submarine. If I was going down, I was going to take a bigger prize with me. The submarine noticed us and absconded swiftly into the depths, leaving a trail of white bubbles. A colleague who went to the United States after the war came across a submarine report in a collection of wartime records. It said, as we extended our periscope above the surface, we saw Japanese fighters heading straight for us. Had we been bombed, we would not have lasted. We continued flying along our scheduled route in search of a worthy target, but came up empty, meaning a return to base to file a target not found report. This was difficult to reconcile, nauseating in fact, as we had already psyched ourselves into a death frenzy. It was raining hard in Ishigakijima and was too difficult to land, so we diverted to Hualien Air Base located on the east coast of Taiwan. I could see a large school of fish below and ditched my bomb for a safe landing. I asked one of the communications officers about the fate of the Zeros that sortied just before us. They hadn't returned, the Tiger Tai record state, missing after assailing enemy ships. Of seven Zeros that made the fifth, Tiger Tai sortie that day, three did not return. We were served a mountain of fish for breakfast the next morning. Apparently, our bombs stunned all the fish and they were gleefully scavenged off the beach by local fishermen. I didn't really have an appetite for fish at the time. In the barracks, the lights were dimmed in our quarters. Most nights we would sit around a candle and drink. Still young, we weren't exactly hardened drinkers, but the older guys did their best to spur us on. The alcohol lightened the mood and we bonded naturally, making plans for our imminent demise together the following day. Pilots were given a flight provision bag every couple of days, which contained a small bottle of rice wine, cigarettes and some cakes with ingredients to suppress drowsiness. When rice wine and chow was in scarce supply, we would head to the kitchen to stock up. Someone told me to go and get more food. I made my way to the kitchen carrying my two handguns. 
My pockets were full of bullets bequeathed to me by dead brothers. I went into the kitchen. Hey, chief, how about some more grub? If the cook declined my request, I was going to shoot the ceiling with my revolvers to shake him up. Some of my buddies had already used this tactic to great effect. The cook grudgingly handed over some canned goods. As soon as the cans were opened in the candlelight, three or four pairs of chopsticks plunged greedily into the fair. Verbal reports of who lived and who died became part of our daily routine. Two teams sorted, one third came back to base. Sixteen zeros sorted today, six didn't make it. This tended to make us even more anxious to get it over with. I want to follow them in a blaze of glory. Our standard conversation was, who's going tomorrow? To which somebody would reply with absolute detachment, that'd be me. We had become indifferent to matters of life and death. Our only concern was making the final moment count. As we participated in our nightly drinking sessions, we learned who would never be joining us again. We'd say to each other, if you get there before me, wait under the cherry trees of Yasukuni Shrine. Or be sure to fly the 205th Air Group's flag in heaven while you wait for the rest of us. To be honest, none of us were particularly religious. It just seemed right to say we'd meet up again in the afterlife. We presumed that as we were being ordered to die for our country, at least we weren't destined for hell. At the end of our drinking sessions, we'd all sing. In the capital of cherry blossoms, Yasukuni Shrine, let us bloom as cherry flowers and meet each other again. There were other kamikaze-specific songs that were sung as well. To live or to die, we know it's farewell forever, but we take off with a smile as the engine roars. One friend and then another, we all perish as heroes. It's my greatest regret that I still breathe. Beneath the palm tree I cry alone. Friend, please know my mind is true. We did not sing loud, and we never got drunk. There was always an element of tension that prevented us from completely letting go. A kind of divination game called cockery was a popular pastime among us. Sitting in a circle in the dim candlelight, we bound three chopsticks together with string and placed the bundle on the mat. We'd then attach a round lid on the chopsticks and spin it, saying, Kokuri, Kokuri, tell me when I'll die. When it stopped moving and pointed at someone, it meant that tomorrow would be his day. Believing this was to be his grand finale, the usual response was along the lines of, I have a camera and cigarettes in my bag, so you take care of them. I didn't buy into this gloomy, superstitious pastime, and I doubt if the others did. We just did it for fun, because we didn't have cards or mahjong to fill in time. Sealants before the storm, briefings were ways held before sorties. We'd analyse reconnaissance photos of shipping taken by scoot planes, and divested the most effective method of attack. The target area for each suicide bomber was decided in advance. The first zero should aim for the rear elevator of the carrier, the second go for the front elevator. The best crash areas were front and rear elevator shafts on the carrier's deck. These were used to bring fighters up for takeoff or to put them in storage in the hangar below deck. If the Zero could somehow dive into an elevator shaft, it could penetrate deeper into the ship and trigger a colossal explosion by setting off the munition stowed below. It was the carrier's Achilles heel, and a direct hit would sink it in a matter of minutes. We were taught to identify the elevator by the vivid markings painted around the entrance. With battleships, the tactic was to fly straight down vertically into the chimney stacks. This required pinpoint accuracy, but would allow the Zero to penetrate the engine room. The sides of battleships were fortified with thick armour plating, and there was the added danger of numerous anti-aircraft machine guns. Failure to crash dive into the designated target, carrier or otherwise, was considered a matter of shame. In spite of our orders, however, all of us really only had our eyes on the carriers. We were typically informed of assignments around 9pm the night before. The officer in charge would come to our quarters. The units to sortie tomorrow are as follows. First bomber is such and such. Second bomber is so and so. Escort such and such. Hearing their orders, assignees would reflexively mumble, Shit, it's me. Although we were all prepared for the directive, it still felt like conferral of the death penalty, and it was stomach-turning. 
Even if the alcohol was starting to kick in, this would sober you up straight away. You go tomorrow, I'll probably follow you the next day. This was the only thing those not assigned could say in consolation. When we heard the footsteps of an officer approaching our room, we would become silent. Nights before sorties were always tinged with melancholy. Those who received the ultimatum would sit in the middle of our circle, ever so slightly illuminated by a flickering candle. Only the outlines of their faces were visible. We rarely spoke as we sipped our rice wine. Those whose names had been announced said nothing, and the others didn't have the heart to talk. We stayed like that until we dosed off. When my name was announced, I was no different. Sometimes someone would ask, do you have any personal effects to take care of? The reply would be no. The atmosphere was that of a wake, and they continued every day. It's impossible to express in words how we really felt inside. We were all healthy young lads in our late teens who were doomed to die the following day, way before our time, but we were resigned to our fates. Eventually somebody would say, let's sleep. We need to be bright and ready for a good showing tomorrow, lads. This was our signal to finish the wake and get some shut-eye. After the war, I read the memoirs written by other airmen who found it hard to sleep. I for one had no trouble sleeping, and I imagine that most of my kamikaze comrades didn't either. Maybe it was because of the booze. I suspect that it was more to do with the fact that we were living as if we were already dead anyway. I was more afraid of being thought of as a coward and never showed any tears. This was normal. Those who had to sortie would board their planes in good spirits, almost, one could say, with expressions of relief etched on their faces. Cherry Blossoms Scattering in the wind, enemy ships were spotted 60 nautical miles south of Miyakojima on the morning of May 4, 1945. The 17th Taigatai sortie departed with 21 bombers and only five escorts. Three teams flew different routes from Yilan Air Base in search of carriers. I was one of the bombers in the second team of four zeros. We searched in vain, however, and were unsuccessful in locating a target. As we were returning to base, I picked up a Morse code message generated by one of the planes from the group that set off before us. Chikato Kondo is about to dive. This was followed by another sequence of beeps declaring that Eichi Hachimura was also about to crash dive into a carrier. They departed only 20 minutes before us, but found their line to glory. We heard later that Superior Flight Petty Officer Tadaatsu Tsune smashed into and destroyed a carrier. Sub-Lieutenant Itsuji Tanimoto and Flight Petty Officer Second Class Chikato Kondo successfully crashed into another carrier, causing it to catch on fire. Details of their attack were recorded by Kazuo Tsunoda, one of the escort pilots. The enemy fleet came into view, 45 degrees to the left. I realised that there were four major carriers accompanied by seven destroyers circling to the east. Tanimoto also saw the flotilla and banked his wings, indicating that he was going in. He flew straight at the carrier from the front right. The enemy did not have time to react with anti-aircraft fire, so Tanimoto was able to penetrate the middle of the deck. His 500 kilo bomb exploded, engulfing the hull in a ball of fire. Minutes later, the second Zero crashed into the rear of a middle-sized carrier. I flew in low behind the third and fourth zeros to avoid the anti-aircraft fire. About two minutes later, I think it was the third zero that smashed into the big carrier to my left rear resulting in an almighty explosion. I lost sight of the fourth, but noticed another big explosion about a minute later through the smoke rising from the same carrier. I presumed that this was the fourth finding its mark. As I departed the hostile zone and the threat of being chased lessened, I was suddenly overcome by sorrow. Chikato's gone. He's really gone. I was inconsolable. Chikato Kondo was a fellow cherry blossom from the Yokoren Special B class. We were together in Iwakuni, Nagoya, Oita, and then in the Storm Corps in Kasanohara. We had been through thick and thin together as many of our fellow cadets dropped out of the course. In the Philippines and then in the Taigitai, we had both survived by such narrow margins so many times. He was an honest man and always obeyed orders without complaining. The brave souls who died in this kamikaze mission were close buddies of mine. They were all great guys. 
It seemed like we were chattering amongst ourselves or playing Japanese a chess only moments before. Next minute, we're out on a sortie looking to go down in a ball of fire. This was the ephemeral existence of kamikaze pilots. Nothing was said when the order to go was given. It was a simple matter of boarding our zeros and flying into oblivion. So many of my friends died like this. Even now, when I see their names on a list somewhere, the faces of each one appears before me exactly as they were in those cheery moments, before jumping into our winged coffins. It could so easily have been me who was assigned that route instead of Chikato. It was all so random. As I approached Ishigakijima, I could see the ground crews were frantically filling potholes on the runway. American bombers had raided our base just after we sorted. There was a small bulldozer available for this task, and it was busy all day, every day. One of the ground crew directed me with hand signals towards suitable section for landing. My fuel gauge showed the tank was almost empty, and I needed to land in a hurry. The landing was heavy, and my zero jolted violently as I touched down on the pockmarked surface. Lives already sacrificed, we lost friends in every sortie. When any one of us somehow returned from a kamikaze mission, the standard greeting became, Oh, you're still here. We sat in a circle to burn incense for the souls of our dead comrades and drank in their honour, knowing that it was more than likely our turn the next day. It was rather odd how our hearts remained serene throughout these days of impending death. The dividing line between life and death had become blurred beyond comprehension. Oddly again, such feelings had a bizarre effect of elevating our mood. Although we were only 18 years old or so, we had come to realise, to some extent, the meaning of life and what it is to be human. Confronting our mortality every living moment enabled us to gain insights which gave us a sense of poise. I knew I would die in my zero, and only wanted to get it over with and follow my buddies into the netherworld. I wasn't resentful, just resigned to the inevitable and determined to go as gracefully as I could. We had been on the receiving end of many hidings by the Americans and knew that we were outdone. There was no way I would shoot down 80 American aircraft in the kind of dogfights Japanese pilots reveled in during the early days of the war. But if I could dive into the elevator shaft of a carrier, then I could take out the ship, the 80 planes it carried, and its 4,000 crewmen. That, I thought, would be my life well spent. I knew from the outset that my duty was service to my country and emperor. Notwithstanding, I never truly harboured lofty thoughts of dying for Japan each time I sorted. I suspect my buddies didn't either. We were all just reconciled to the fact that death was inexorable. We had an appointment with annihilation as it was our calling. My family and relatives were trying to get on with life back home, and if my sacrifice contributed to their well-being even in a small way, then there were no regrets. The only thing I desired was an honourable end to my life as an airman. As such, I did not leave a will and testament, nor did I write letters to my family. Few of us did. Students drafted into kamikaze missions from air bases in Kyushu, however, did write to their families. This is understandable. Student draftees, society's best and brightest, were forced into foregoing promising futures with a one-way ticket to a fiery grave. Despite their abysmal lack of training and experience, they were expected to immolate themselves on the lowest hanging fruit. We Yokaran pilots, on the other hand, were always prepared for death from the moment we chose our vocation. We were somehow able to come to accept it as our preordained life mission to crash dive into carriers for the sake of the war effort. Student draftees were superior in rank than we NCOs because of their higher education. In one fleet we would sometimes see as many as 20 student draftees wearing the uniform of ensign or sub-lieutenant. Naval Academy graduates were treated completely different to student soldiers, even if their rank was the same. They were reluctant to share authority with student draftees, and there was blatant discrimination in the crew quarters. I remember one student sub-lieutenant would come and shack up with us in the NCO barracks, rather than cavort with his equals in the commissioned officer quarters. More student draftees were killed than Naval Academy graduates, but even more Yokaran graduates died than students. 
Although we were all on the same side and in the same fleet, elitism was prevalent and highly unpleasant. The devastation of Okinawa, I made another sortie on May 18th as a member of the 20th Taigitai mission. I was a bomber in a team of eight zeros. There were two escorts and sub-Lieutenant Tsunoda was in charge. Our objective was to attack American ships in the seas south of Miyakojima. The weather turned bad soon after taking off, so we had to return to base. In middle of June, however, a decree came out of the blue to cease all kamikaze missions. We had no idea why, but heard rumours that Okinawa was about to capitulate. This was clearly not good for Japan, but at least we could relax a little now that kamikaze attacks were suspended. I figured that with the fall of Okinawa, the Americans would be moving their ships and troops there instead of around Ishigakijima and Miyakojima. We also figured that many would be returning to their homeland or to Australia for leave. We heard nothing about any attacks on Taiwan, but that didn't mean we were out of harm's way. When the enemy did return, they would be fresh and have their tails up. We, on the other hand, were completely shattered. The few zeros that still survived were all damaged and covered in patches. Our bases were constantly under attack by B-29s coming from China, and they were clearly scouting Taiwan also. They flew at around 7,000 to 8,000 metres from where they dropped their payloads on us. The bombs were not so big at around 60 kilos or so, but they released 100 to 150 on our heads each time. We monitored the flight direction of the B-29s to gauge whether we were in danger or not. If they came directly over us, we knew it was OK because the bombs would fall on angle and miss. It was a different story if they let go 30 or 40 degrees before us. Still, nothing was certain. When I was in Yilan one time, bombs suddenly fell out of nowhere. I leapt into a shelter just as one exploded 30 metres away, another close shave. In Yilan, we concealed our precious zeros in a small village located about 400 metres from the base. We rolled them into the village and covered them with foliage or carpet as camouflage. The Americans refrained from targeting planes hidden in villages to mitigate collateral damage to the inhabitants. They probably realised that destroying airstrips would suffice and knew that we had virtually no operational zeros to worry about anyway. We took the zeros we did have out on patrol every so often, and even did combat training to keep our skills honed. The problem was that high-quality fuel was now unobtainable, and we had to make do with low-purity gasoline. This meant the engines lacked power and would sometimes cut out completely, intercepting and chasing enemy. Fighters was not an option. Dance of the Fireflies, the temporary cessation of kamikaze missions, soon came to an end. I was assigned to the 24th Taigatai mission, organised a few days before August 15th, 1945. Our orders were to carry out a suicide attack on enemy shipping around Okinawa with all available operational planes. It had been almost two months since our last kamikaze sortie in the middle of June. To be honest, the suddenness of the order was flabbergasting. Stranger still was the fact that there was no information indicating carriers were in the region. Nothing seemed right. In any case, intuition told me that my time had come for sure. I was in Taichung at the time, and we were ordered to relocate to Yilan the next day for our final sortie. Four of us went to a tavern in a small village near the base. We walked through the rice fields on the south side of the barracks, carefully negotiating the narrow paths. As darkness consumed the landscape, we saw masses of fireflies flitting over the rice plants. There were so many that they crashed, dived into our bodies and faces, as if to repel intruders trespassing their domain. The fireflies were much smaller than the variety we were used to in Japan. They must be rice bran fireflies, somebody observed. The fireflies that swooped through the air in my home village of Kotesashi were much bigger. I had a flashback of how I used to catch them in my childhood. The swarm of fireflies that appeared before us that night was something to behold. There are so many, I thought, but I will never see them again. We could make out faint blue and white streaks as they flitted haphazardly before us. The life of Firefly is short. I felt a close connection with them. There was only one drinking hole in the village. We took the room in the back and sat on the straw mats. 
We opened the window and gazed at the wild dancing of the fireflies while sipping rice wine from our cups. We didn't talk much. Although we had been drinking most days, the sack that night tasted particularly good. I said to the fireflies, Hey, come on in and join us. Some of them really did. Farewell to you, fireflies, for tomorrow I will not be of this world. I remember downing one big bottle of sake that night, but we were not overly intoxicated. We kept drinking until two or three in the morning, then walked back to base as we sang kamikaze attack songs, legs slightly unsteady as we stumbled through the paddies. It was the first and last time I have ever seen fireflies dancing the way they did that night. Morning came, and we flew to Yilan, ready to die.